How you doing, folks? Welcome back to the Dash of Milan. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time in my little discussion on Field of Glory 3rd Edition, my review, somewhat of an in-depth look at this set of rules, what makes it tick, how does it play, is it worth buying, so on and so forth. If you haven't seen the first part of this video, check out the link as well as the description and check it out. It might be worthwhile. But otherwise, we're going to take a look at the rest of the book today and finish off by having my review, my final verdict on this set of rules and whether or not it's worth having on your bookshelf or mine for that matter. So let's jump right in, folks. The shooting is very straightforward. It's uh, very reminiscent of many other games like Lark de Guerre and DBX. Both sides shoot. Uh, ranges are interesting. Uh, the maximum range for... Uh, uh, bows and long bows, depending on the troop type using them, uh, could be up to six uh, movement, un movement units for bows and long bows with medium foot. Same applies for light foot. The difference is the effective range, uh, which is four for medium foot and three for uh, the light foot. So this gives you an idea of what the ranges are like in this game. Uh, for heavy artillery, it's 12. It's quite a quite a distance. So effective range and maximum range are both covered in this. Most weapons are at effective range. If your unit is at effective range or less, it has to shoot. But otherwise, if it's at maximum range, it's an option to shoot. You don't have to shoot. Uh, it talks about movement and shooting, uh, which is normally possible. Target priorities, the arc of fire, line of sight and visibility, overhead shooting, which is interesting, and shooting and close combat, how it works. So it's a very short section, uh, the shooting section. And then it jumps right into the melee phase. And we're closing in on the end of the turn here. Uh, after this, of course, will be the joint action phase. It talks about overlaps, melees that cannot line up, which can happen in complex situations. Fighting enemy in two directions, which also can happen when a battle group is charged in a flank or rear. Usually when that happens, uh, the bases that are contacted during the charge, the impact phase, uh, the defender will be his bases will be turned to face that charging enemy. Just the bases that are touching. Uh, so you can see how some bases could be facing different directions as a result of a charge in different uh, in the flank or the rear, uh, and so on. It talks about sacking camps, always important. Now it goes into the combat mechanism. Now this is a very important section. It's, I'd say, as important as the general maneuvering or general movement section, which preceded the impact phase chapter. Uh, this is another section that's very important, and all of your combat follows the rules laid out in here. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. I'm not going to go into much detail with it, uh, but I will say that normally how this game works is the first thing you will do in a melee, or when you're shooting, or as a result of a charge, you'll first want to find out how many dice you can roll. And both sides do this, and it's based on various factors. Number one, if you're shooting, or if it's an impact, or if it's a melee phase combat, all three are covered here, and they have their own little listing of modifiers. Typically, one uh, might apply, sometimes two, maybe three different modifiers will apply in an instance here, uh, which is usually the result of, uh, for instance, light foot or light horse. Uh, they get reductions to the number of dice in melee as well as impact phase. Uh, also, if they're disrupted or disordered, as well as being fragmented or severely disordered, can also reduce the number of dice you roll. But the net effect of this is you, you uh, determine how many dice you're going to roll, and it's based on various little modifiers that may apply, and you get a basic number of dice to roll. Next, you're gonna find out what you need to roll on each of those dice to score a hit. And these th these tables right here tell you you got your close combat rolls to hit, and then you got your shooting rolls to hit, and these are based on something unique. It's called the point of advantage. Your points of advantage. Uh, when one unit has an advantage uh, over another, uh, it will get so many points of advantage, and it's either two pluses, one plus, or no POA at all. Uh, and the opponent, the defender. Uh, or the one with no advantage, will get the direct opposite of that. So two pluses equals two negatives. A single plus equals a single negative. And if he doesn't have any advantage, no pluses, neither does the opponent. And this tells you, based on that, what you need to roll. For instance, if I was fighting against some Gaul warriors and we went through our charts and tables, and I found out that I have two POA 
against his one. Well, what happens is that each opposing plus will cross each other out. So he has one and I have two. So two of them cross each other out. So that leaves me with only one plus left. And that is greater than his, which is zero at that point, which means I have the advantage. So how that works is I have one point of advantage and he gets the direct opposite, red as a negative, which is one negative POA. So he's gonna need fives to hit on all of his dice. I'm gonna need, because I have one point of advantage at this point, fours. That's how it works. It sounds a little confusing, and it's, and it's actually kind of difficult to describe, but when you sit down and after reading this, and it will actually play out uh, a couple melees, you catch on very quickly. I gave you a, a, the gist of it right there, but it's, it's very intriguing how it works. And the best advantage you can have is having a double plus, and the worst, of course, would be a double negative. So that's points of advantage. That tells you what you need to roll on your dice. Uh, Accumulating hits and taking cohesion tests. Now, a side that loses the melee, in other words, suffered the most hits, uh, loses the melee. He has to make a cohesion test. And that's, that reminds me a lot of how, the, how it works in Impetus, uh, where if you lose the combat, you have to make these cohesion tests. Uh, besides cohesion tests, and I should mention that the result of a cohesion test will be the degradation of your... Uh, your uh, oh, what am I what am I thinking here? Let's see, battle group deterioration, right here. Cohesion levels. That's what I'm looking for. You start off as steady, go to disrupted. The next worst is fragmented, and finally, the worst is broken. Well, you start off as steady, but as you fail cohesion tests, this drops. And like I said, if you lose a melee uh, or if you take enough casualties from shooting. You'll have to make a cohesion test. It's also called a CT, or cohesion test. Basically, you need to roll two dice. You need to score seven or more to have no effect. Uh, basically, the result of your roll determines what happens. Maybe you'll lose just one cohesion level. You'll go from steady to disrupted. Or maybe you'll drop two cohesion levels, like if you were hitting the flank or something. It could drop to fragmented, where previously it was steady. That's quite bad. But uh, basically, it's a die roll. You need a seven or greater. Otherwise, you look at this table. It tells you the results. This is also what is done when you try to rally troops. Commanders with units that have less than steady cohesion levels can be rallied. And it's basically the same test, a cohesion test. And that will have separate results, of course. A seven or more means you pop up one of on the ladder of uh, disruption here. If you were fragmented and you pass the test, cohesion test to rally, you go up to disrupted. Uh, it kind of works like that, very simple and straightforward. Also, when you lose a melee or if you take enough casualties from shooting, you'll have to make what's called death rolls. Now, your death rolls will be done before your cohesion test because death rolls represent losing bases of troops. And that could have an effect on your cohesion test as you lose more men you're going to get penalized on your test even more. So the death roll is done first, and it's a simple d6 roll. You have to roll greater than the number of hits that you suffered to be successful. And there's only two modifiers, plus one if you're, uh, if the dice, if the dice score, uh, add plus one to the dice score if elephants, artillery, or battle wagons, or for any battle group that started the game with two bases only. You get a plus one on your death roll. Add plus two to the die roll if the hits suffered were from shooting or the battle group won or drew a close combat. So if you won but you still have to make a death roll because you took so many casualties, you get a plus two to that. So it's not as likely that you're going to lose a base. A failed death roll results in the loss of a base. And if you get enough hits, it can actually result in the loss of more than one base. Interesting. So that is a quick rundown of how the close combat mechanic works, and how units uh, lose cohesion levels, degrade in their abilities as a result of losing combats or suffering a lot of casualties. Uh, talks about support shooting when you got multiple units shooting at a charger, for instance, during the impact phase, or uh, you got commanders in the close combat, how they work. Uh, they could die if they're fighting in the front rank, trust me. Uh, and it talks about special cases such as fighting broken troops, movement of broken troops, and etc. 
it's enough to say that if you attack broken troops in melee, you're probably going to destroy them. And it's very simple and straightforward. Is when a unit routes as a result of being broken, the pursuers move into them. If they make contact and maintain contact, the, the broken unit loses a base automatically and can be destroyed that way. There is what is called automatic break in this game. And once a unit has taken enough casualties, it's considered automatically broken. Uh, even if there's still some bases left, it will be removed and routed from the table. Uh, nice, good, close combat example, which answers a lot of questions as well for you. And finally, we get into the joint action phase, the last final phase, the fifth phase of a turn. And basically things that can happen here is the troops can break off, you can stop troops from looting a camp, uh, routing and pursuers. Um, when a unit breaks, it's going to make an initial route, and that's during the actual combat phase when it happens. But during the joint action phase, it will route move again, uh, usually towards your table edge or away from the charger or enemy that it's fighting. Pursuers will also pursue them. And again, if they maintain contact, it will... Uh, the routers will lose bases from that. Uh, in some cases, whole battle groups will be removed from the table during this joint action phase. And also, commanders can move again uh, during the turn, and this is where they can do that. And they also rally troops during this uh, phase, bolstering and rallying of troops, which occurs after any movement they take. Uh, and again, I showed this earlier, uh, how battle groups degrade, uh, talks about fragmented troops being charged and remember fragmented troops is one step away from being broken and they are very fragile when they're at the fragmented status uh, you don't want them to be charged uh, you can make cohesion tests as a result of post combat seeing friends or battle groups units broken uh, or if a commander gets killed uh, and so on and so forth. The cohesion test, as I said before, is also used to bolster and rally units. In other words, go up the ladder of cohesion levels. Talks about mixed battle groups, multiple causes during one single test. Sometimes you're forced to make a cohesion test for several different uh, reasons at once. This shows you how that works. Uh, how commanders and cohesion tests work, testing multiple battle groups, and so on and so forth. And there's the death rolls. And this is a little table here that outlines exactly what the rules uh, are for troops that are disrupted, fragmented, and broken. And all the little modifiers and things that have influenced them during the rest of the game are shown here. So that's a nice little convenient table. I like that table. It talks about base removal. If you're shot at and you lose a base, or if you're routing and you lose a base, or if you're in close combat and you lose a base, again, as a result of failed death rolls, this tells you how to remove specific bases from the unit. Here's where we talk about auto-breaking. Next, we go into victory and, te and defeat. This is how you win your battles, and it's pretty much straightforward, like any DBX or large to Laguerre. You know, units are worth so many points, and you lose uh, points uh, as you lose units, and eventually you are forced to um, lose the battle, basically. Next, we go into special features like elephants, camels, scythe chariots, field fortifications, uh, portable defenses, and the orb formation. Now, now we're going to get into the next section, which is very useful. This is the reference section. And again, take note of the color coding here. And these are all your appendices, your scales and base sizes, um, figure scales. If you want to play this game in different figure scales, such as 28 millimeter, you can do it. These rules provide you with the rules to do so. Uh, the ground scale, the time scale, the base sizes are all detailed right here. This tells you, if you're not familiar with DBX, this tells you how you base your figures and the size of bases you will use for both 15 mil and 28, 25 millimeter figures. Uh, let's see here. Uh, using troops based from other systems, like if your ba figures are based for uh, Impetus, for instance, or uh, Hail Caesar, this would tell you how you can incorporate them. Uh, troops in detail. Now, if you like to tinker with your own units, tinker with your own army lists, this is very useful. It talks about how you can, how the rules categorize the different types of armor, uh, as well as combat capabilities and the troop types, what, what each category represents basically 
uh, realistically. So you could classify troops in a way that you find more realistic or historical. This shows you how the rules do that. And it's uh, quite a bit to it. So it's a very useful section if you like the historical, realistic side of things. And each of the combat capabilities and what they represent. So on and so forth. Training. Next appendix is battlefield terrain, visibility, and disorder effects. Okay, so this is all about your terrain on the tabletop. And here's a great table here that tells you every piece of terrain you can have, its abbreviation, as well as how it works, I mean, how it's classed. Like, these are all rough terrain. Your brush, enclosed fields, plantations, gullies, these are all rough. And it, it helps describe those areas for you. Uh, and talks about visibility within and outside of it and into it right here in that section. So this is a very useful table. Uh, over here on this side, same thing, except we're talking about the effects of terrain. What exactly is disordered? What exactly is severely disordered? All the little modifiers that apply for them are listed here in this table. It's all right here. Very convenient. Next, we get into the third appendix, which is Glossary of Terms. Now, this is a very useful section, and you'll be using it quite a bit. You might even want to photocopy this section of the rules, and it's only, I believe, four pages. Yeah. And these are all the specific terms that Field of Glory utilizes in the rules, such as what is a death roll? There it is right there. What does one dice per X bases mean? Here it is right there. Uh, line of command, what does that term mean? Uh, what is a melee? How do the rules view a melee? What is it? Movement units, MU, and so on and so forth. It's a really useful glossary of terms. Uh, you want to pay attention to this section of the rules. There, a threat and flank, a threat and flank uphill. Ah, oh, this is a duplicate. I just noticed that here. There's two listings for threat and flank. All right, a little typo. That's okay. Next, we got Appendix 4, which is the setup rules. Now, these are the actual rules for setting up your battlefield, placing terrain. And it's a very straightforward, simple system. I'm not going to go into it, of course, but it talks about pre-battle initiative, uh, who will be placing terrain first, what terrain type you will be play playing on for your battlefield. Every army, army has terrain types, which includes various terrain pieces that can be... Uh, laid out and chosen from. For example, terrain types are developed, agricultural, hilly, woodlands, steppes, mountains, tropical, desert, uh, blah, blah. So those are your types that every army has in their army lists, and this tells you the types of terrain you will find in there. Uh, it's a very straightforward system. Uh, it also talks about how you deploy your troops once the terrain is placed on the table. Uh, as usual with Ancients rules, uh, you're going to have a lot of detail in terrain placement and deployment of troops, much like L'Art de la Guerre and uh, any of the DBX games. They really go into detail about that because it's important with ancient uh, warfare. Field fortification, supplies, camps, and ambushes. There is ambushes in these rules, which are usually indicated by a little marker. Several of them, in fact, if you want to use that many, where troops can be hiding which is kind of cool. It also has outflanking marches, troops marching on a flank, or maybe troops that have disembarked from ships uh, to your right and are marching towards the battle. That's what's represented here. And again, deploying for battle. So all your rules for deploying and laying out terrain and defining terrain are all in this back section here, this appendix, appendix four. This section, Appendix 5, covers the point system, how it works, how points work in the game, and how to read an army list. And it gives, uh, example, full army lists for the later Carthaginians, for example. How commanders fit into that, uh, battle group composition, and so on. Appendix 6, choosing your army. This is like uh, something if you're new to Ancients Wargaming. This section here will be very helpful for you if you know nothing about ancient warfare, middle, medieval warfare. How to choose your army. What's going to work for you to help you secure that victory in battle against the enemy? This kind of helps you. And tactical advice for beginners. How about that? That's an excellent section to have in a rule book. Very useful. Next we go to Appendix 7, which is examples of unusual situation. Much like DBA has a whole section of uh, illustrated examples of unusual situation and rules interpretations, so also does Field of Glory 3. Uh, again, this is fully illustrated in full color for you, so you're getting all these examples 
laid out for you in full color and clear. Next is Appendix 8, the Ready Reckoner. And like I said, to give you an example of what we're talking about here, bases in first three ranks of battle group. Let's say there's five. It tells you that the number of hits required to count as one hit per two bases is three. So when you see a modifier, say in Melee, it says minus one if you suffered one hit per two bases. This is a quick way to find out if you did suffer one hit per two bases. Again, let's say we were five. If we suffered three, we suffer that modifier. This is just a quick way of doing it. Normally, it's easy to figure out you know, in your head, but for some people, this might be useful for you. And likewise, over here for shooting dice and uh, reducing combat dice. Because you know, one of the penalties of reducing your combat dice when you attack is from uh, disorder and things. And it will say you lose one dice per three. Well, that's pretty easy to figure out. If you have six dice and you lose one dice per three, you're going to lose two dice. But for some people, it might be useful to just refer to a table. And that's what this is. Again, let's look up six dice. Uh, drop one dice per three. We'll say that's the penalty. It says two. So it's just a quick way to find that. The game, the rule book is attempting to be as complete as it possibly can for as many people. So this is a welcome add. It's nothing uh, overdone, I don't think. And finally, Appendix 9, the full turn sequence. This you want to photocopy or find online. I, I basically printed mine out, and it is extremely useful. Uh, you just follow each turn, and it tells you what to do one row at a time, I should call this one block at a time. So resolve all shooting, both sides shoot, resolve death rolls, then post shooting cohesion tests. Next, after the above is completed for all shooting, resolve CTs, cohesion tests, for seeing friends break. Next, we do this. It's, it's very useful uh, to know exactly where you are in the turn and just go through these steps one at a time. So you're definitely going to want to copy this and make use of it. Finally, we have our index. Always welcome. I've used it a few times to find things, but thankfully it's not a huge book, so you really don't have to look up too much. If you really are having trouble finding something, uh, that's when the index kicks into gear and it proves its worth. A little advertising here. And here's where we have a whole bunch of charts and tables for the game. Now, this might be a turnoff for a lot of people, because look at all that. That's a lot of tables, and it looks like a just horrendous amount of modifiers and exceptions and must-dos and must-don'ts. But uh, trust me, folks, when I say that this game is quite simple and straightforward. When you first learn it, it is daunting, and there is quite a bit of page flipping in the rule book but you know what it's worth it in my opinion i enjoyed the games i have played of this set of rules field of glory immensely i enjoy the level of detail it's not overwhelming at all i enjoy the unique combat me mechanic of points of advantage i enjoy that quite a bit uh, it checks a lot of boxes for me when it comes to ancients Wargaming, and I've, I've had a love-hate relationship with Ancients Wargaming for a long time, and it has a lot to do with the fact that most rules seem geared towards competitive gameplay, and it can get kind of frustrating. I mean, how am I going to represent uh, more historical tactics in my game, uh, for, for instance, if it's just so focused on tournament play and just line them up and fight? How does reserves work, you know? How, do, how does my army deploy historically? I've always had issues with that with a lot of different roles. But this game has pulled me back in and has satisfied that. Uh, I enjoy the fact that it uses units as opposed to elements, single-based elements, as in DBX. Uh, units that are bigger than Lark de la Guerre's one or two or three bases in the case of pikemen i like units that look like units that can change formation uh that can move independently uh, and be routed independently and fight independently of others there's a lot of feel of impetus uh in this game with a touch of dbx in it i like that if you, some of you guys that know me from the past videos i've done know that i was a big fan of impetus and um uh, this seems like a much better version of Impetus to me, personally. 
I never liked impetuses, big bases. I'd like my units to kind of be able to maneuver a little bit. And for some people, it's all about the bases and impetus. But for me, I like the DBX bases, and I like a number of them to be in a unit, or battle group as they're called in here, and be able to change formation. I want to move along a road in a column. I want to be able to do that and look right. This rule, set of rules does that for me. Uh, that is a look of the rules, my friends. Uh, I'm not going to go into any deeper detail than I have. I mean, this video is already going to be way too long. But I hope I covered a lot of the basics of what this game is, how it approaches ancient and medieval combat. And as far as my opinion on it, I think this version of the game, I've never played the first or second editions of the game. Uh, I've heard a lot about it, though. And this version of the game convinced me that it is not a difficult or complex game to play. It's, it's really easier than it looks. It's one of those types of games. And it might feel confusing when you're first learning the game, like most games. Uh, but after your first game, maybe two games, you get the hang of things really quick. And it's a very uh, enjoyable game system, in my opinion. If I was to rate this in a scale of one to five, I would give this at least a four, all around in general, at least a four, in my opinion. Uh, so there you go, folks. That I hope this video has helped you uh, in understanding Field of Glory 3, if you've been contemplating getting it uh, or getting into it. Uh, I think this is a good choice if you want a game that feels less gamey and has some fun elements to it and has units moving around the table. This is a way to go. The only downside is when you're learning, there's going to be a lot of page flipping. There might be a lot of page flipping uh, as you have played several games, in fact. I mean, it's like that. Um, but then you get the hang of it pretty quick. Uh, if you like units, it's, it's just for you. Something unique and fun, it's just for you. Something more than DBX. It's very enjoyable. Uh, what else was I going to say? I am going to do more videos and reviews on this, uh, so stay tuned for those. Uh, needless to say, I, I hope you guys got something out of this, and I hope you enjoyed. And if you have any questions about this set of rules, uh, leave them in the comments or message me here on YouTube and let me know, and I will get back to you. So there you go, folks. That was my look at Field of Glory 3rd Edition, as well as my review. And I'll give my final thoughts yet on the game system. I thoroughly enjoyed playing this game. Whether you're new to Ancients Gaming or you're an old hat at it, maybe you've played uh, DBMM or you're a player of Field of Glory previous editions, this 3rd Edition was quite enjoyable to me. Like I said earlier, I've never played Field of Glory. I played the computer version, but I never played the actual tabletop version of the game. I was quite surprised how easy it was to play the game. I always thought it was a little bit uh, too much. The combat system was just strange to me or whatever. Like I said, I never played it. But since I have tried the game and played recently, I absolutely love it. It's, it's a great game system that has inspired me enough to get back into Ancients Gaming. Anybody that knows me knows that I've had a love-hate relationship with Ancients Gaming. Really fond of L'Art de la Guerre, love DBMM, or the DBX style of playing, love that, impetus of course. I just lost interest, it just didn't catch with me. And I realize now that by playing Fog and having units have a, a character to, of themselves on the tabletop, I enjoyed that. It's something you don't see with DBX, where one unit is an element. It's basically a base. Like to Laguerre, same thing. Sometimes it's a couple bases or three bases. It's still just one little block, and it doesn't change its appearance by changing formations. Impetus, same thing. Love that game, except you could never change formations and do things. And, and in a sense, I guess it's because I enjoy tactical games, or at least the idea of them. And this set of rules gives that to me, and I enjoy that. I enjoy changing the formations of my units and having them act somewhat independently, yet still be able to form up into those battle lines and marches groups and do that. I enjoy that. I also love the game mechanic, actually. It's very eloquent, actually, the way it works. You don't have a lot of floating modifiers in your head. What's your advantage and to what degree? Is it by one or is it by two? And the opponent, obviously, will be on the opposite end of that spectrum. It's actually quite simple. 
all in all, I enjoy it. I think having the option to play Fog 300 nowadays makes the game more accessible because like a lot of people will say that play Fog, you need a lot of miniatures to play. And uh, typically a game is, I think, 600 to 800 points in value. And that's pretty big. Like I said at the beginning, it's the standard size armies, two, 300 figures, I can imagine. If you're just starting out, I think Fog 300 gives you that opportunity. I hope to actually talk more about Fog 300 in the future. But all in all, I did enjoy this set of rules. On a scale of one to five, I'd give it a four. Yes, that's pretty good with me. Everything can stand some improvement somewhere. So it gets a nice solid four. It's going to have a nice presence on my bookshelf. Uh, it's got me motivated to play Ancients again. I'm very excited to play and paint up some new figures for my Gauls and my Romans, as well as my feudal troops that I have an abundance of. I plan on doing some more bat reps, and maybe if you guys want it and want to see something like this, I'll do a how to play series. Um, maybe not as intense as my impetus how to play series. I don't know. That was, that was a pretty big deal. I think it went like 14 plus episodes. I don't know. We'll see. It depends on what you guys want to see and what I have time to do. If you want to see something like that, let me know in the comments. But all in all, I enjoy the game. I enjoy the way it plays. It's, it's a fast moving game. It's easy to get to grips with. There's some page flipping and a learning curve in the very beginning. Once you get past that, it's worth the effort and it's a very enjoyable game. So thumbs up for Field of Glory, third edition. Again, I haven't played the first or second editions. I like this one. So I do recommend you try this out if you have any interest in Ancients Gaming. And don't be intimidated by needing big armies because you can play with smaller armies. Okay, folks, let me know what you think about Field of Glory 3rd Edition, this video, this review, Ancients Gaming in general. Let me know what you think. If I inspired you somewhat to get into Field of Glory or Ancients Gaming, you have any questions about it, something I forgot or left out of the video, let me know. Private message me or just leave them in the comments. So thanks for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed and appreciate the video. Like, share, and subscribe. Let people know about Field of Glory. Let me know your comments. Until next time, I guess I'll be seeing you guys again. We'll see what else I'm going to be taking a look at. i got a lot of things in the pipeline. Uh, until then, folks, hang in there. It's only going to get better.